Welcome. I'm going to take a little sip of my coffee real quick, trying to break the ice. Invite you into our Bible study this evening. We continue. Okay. I was afraid we were having a connection problem there. It appears like we're on. Okay, so I know that last week, if you uh, were watching and trying to watch through to the end, uh, the lesson cut off early, probably only a minute or so early, but uh, it just suddenly broke off, I'm not sure what happened. And I didn't like what I saw just a second ago, so I don't know what's going to happen here. I don't know why we're suddenly having some problems, but hopefully this will work out. But uh, you didn't miss a whole lot, really, at the end. We were working through our last passage, uh, which last week I think was uh, Ezekiel 34. And, and we had uh, done most everything from that. <clears throat> so, uh, again, thank you for being a part of study. And uh, we're going to continue in it in it tonight for a little bit. Let's begin with prayer. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for your blessings and your care, for watching over us, and for giving us your word to share. Pray you'll bless us as we get into it tonight and think about things very important to our spiritual life. Pray your blessings on all those who participate, whether live or by recording, that you'll be with them this week, keep them safe. Uh, pray for those that are suffering across the nation tonight in, in the cold, uh, that you'll give them warmth and relief soon. Thank you for our homes and, and those things we take for granted. Uh, thank you for your love in Christ, for all he offers us. We pray in his name. Amen. All right, so there is a, a, at least another word or two that we need to look at to get a, uh, a fuller view of peace in the Bible. And um, at least in the Old Testament, we've started in the Old Testament. And these uh, related words are the words that are usually translated rest. Uh, there's really a couple of Old Testament words translated rest that are important. But we're not going to go so much into the technicality of the word themselves, but, uh, but how they're used. And so if I were to ask you to define rest, um, how would you do that? Would it be something like ceasing activity or maybe even something like laying down or sleeping or napping? Um, that's a common understanding of rest. It's not always what the word means in Scripture, of course. Uh, for instance, we've been taught pretty much all our lives that God created for six days and that he rested on the seventh. Uh, we're familiar with that. And the question is, what does that mean, that God rested on the seventh day? Did God cease all his activity on the seventh day? Um, does he, did he stop doing stuff and he doesn't do anything anymore? Or is the idea that, that, that the creation, the work of creation sort of tired him out and he needed rest, he needed a nap, uh, that he had worked too hard or something like that? Of course, that's ridiculous. God is uh, not limited like that. We understand that. But what does it mean that he rested? I don't know if you've ever pondered that much, uh, but it's 
pretty important to think about, especially in connection with what we're, we're trying to think through. And I wanted to approach it at first by giving you a series of illustrations of the idea, and then we'll try and apply it and, and look at the scripture. Illustration number one, uh, think about the fact that we just had an election, okay? And, uh, you know, a new president um, probably has aspired to, to become president for a long time. They've probably been working at it for most of their adult life. Sometimes that's not the case, but uh, usually they're pretty ambitious people. So, you know, when, when a president, uh, a new president, looks forward to taking up residence in the White House, why is that? Why do they want to move into that house? Um, do they want to do it because, wow, they've got a big house now and they can sort of ki kick back and relax and sleep a lot? Again, that's sort of ridiculous, isn't it? Uh, that's not why. They, they want the White House. Uh, it is a place to work hard and to move an agenda that they have and to accomplish things, right? I mean, that's what, uh, not that they don't want to live in the White House, but that's the, the point is not uh, taking up residence in that house and then uh, stopping all activity, just being satisfied to be there. They have things in mind that they want to do. And... Um, as hard and grueling as the campaign trail, no doubt, is, as hard of work as that is, the real work starts when the president moves in, correct? You know, that's, that's when the real work starts. Keep that in mind. That's, that's one way of looking at this idea. Illustration number two. Uh, you buy a new computer, or these days, maybe it's just you, you get a new smartphone. They're almost one and the same, aren't they? But when you, when you first get it, there is some definite work in setting it up, getting it ready. Uh, you might have to install software. You may have to set up certain preferences for those, the ways you want it to work and all those kinds of things. There's a little bit of time, at least, unless the, uh, the salesperson does all the work for you, which sometimes they do with smartphones these days. They've made it uh, super easy on us. But uh, most of us, when we buy a computer, have some work to do to set it up, to get it ready. And, and why is it that you do all that? Well, is it so you can sit it on your desk or on a shelf and, and sort of look at it and say, look what I did. I got a computer and I set it up. Well, of course not. You do all that work beforehand uh, so you can really start using that piece of equipment for the reason that you got it. Uh, that's why you do that. Um, keep that in mind as well, because that applies and what we're thinking about. Illustration number three. And this is one that really uh, strikes home with me due to recent experience. You and your family decide to move uh, to a new place. It's a lot of work. In fact, it's something I never want to do again because of so much work. Um, and anybody that's done it realizes the, the amount of work. You know, you got not only to decide where to move, you got to sell a house probably, and then you have to buy a house, all that goes into that. And then you got to move into a new house with, with all the stuff, uh, all, you know, all the boxes, maybe all the work you need to do to get that house ready for you to move in. Um, and, and once you do that, okay, what's it like in that place? When you finally take possession and you get these things in there, it is a mess. 
It is a jumbled mess unless somebody else, unless you pay somebody else to set it all up. Uh, nothing is arranged. Nothing's ordered. You've got boxes stacked on tops of, of boxes. You know, you have a house, but is it functional? Is it what you want it to be? No. So you do all this work and it may take weeks to unpack, it may take months um, to put things in order. All right. Why? Why do you do all that? All that work. Do you do it so you can sit back and take a nap? Uh, no. You do it to, to make the house your home. You do it to start normal house operations. You do it to start being able to live there, right? And whatever that means for you and your family, um, that's, that's what you do. So three illustrations, um, president moving into the White House, uh, buying a new computer or, or phone, and uh, you moving into a new place. This is all going somewhere, all right? I want to read a single verse for now uh, in the Old Testament. It's in Exodus, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11. All right, you might notice that as, um, in, in context, that's the Ten Commands, Ten Commandments. So verse 11 says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, uh, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and made it holy. So back to, you know, we started with this idea of creation. For six days, it says that God made things. He um, made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them. That's sort of a summary. We know that there was more than just that. But for six days, God made, God created. On the seventh day, he, he rested. Rested on the seventh day. And notice that in, this is all in context again of the Ten Commandments and specifically the Sabbath command. Remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. Uh, verse 11 is the last part of that. Uh, but notice in that statement, it says that God blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Uh, it doesn't say that he blessed uh, day six, day five, day four, so forth. He blessed the seventh day. He blessed the Sabbath. On the seventh day, he rested. He blessed that day. Why? Why is that day special? I think a lot of times when we think of creation week, we, um, we look at the seventh day as the least important day because he doesn't create on the seventh. And I think we struggle with what to do with the seventh day. But God blessed that day. He singled it out. He blessed it and made it holy and eventually commanded his people to behave on a certain way on the Sabbath day. Uh, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, God told them. Uh, and so what is it about that day? What happens on day seven? Uh, day seven is the day when normal world functioning began, after God set everything in order and created. So it's sort of, think of our illustrations. Uh, it's the day he moved into the White House, okay, in, in, in the way we illustrate it. It's the day he started using uh, the computer for computer stuff. It's the day he started to enjoy home like a home is intended to be enjoyed, all right? Until it was created, set up, or ordered, he couldn't do that, could he? So when he could finally do that, 
he blessed that day. That was a special day. All right, what's this have to do with peace and rest? Later on in the Old Testament, God is going to tell Israel and various kings of Israel and leaders, different times he does this, he'll say to them, well, there's a time coming when I will give you rest from your enemies. He says he's going to give them. It's the same word used in, in uh, Exodus 20, verse 11, uh, where it says he rested on the seventh day. Now, just a, a note on that back in Exodus 20. Uh, you know, verse 8 says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That word Sabbath, Shabbat, is the, is the original word. And that's the word used in uh, Genesis 1 and 2 when God uh, stopped creating. He Shabbated. He stopped creating. But in verse 11, where it says, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and rested on the seventh day, that's not the word Sabbath. That's not the Shabbat rest. That is uh, Nuach, Noah. We know Noah's name, uh, which means to rest as well. These are the two words we're talking about this evening. It's a different word. It means, in, a, in essence, the same thing. Uh, and, and later on, when God tells Israel and different kings and leaders of Israel that I'm going to give you rest from your enemies, that's this word Noah, Nuach, in, in Hebrew. Uh, an example of a place he does this is in Deuteronomy. Um, Deuteronomy 12 and I think verse 10 is where it starts. Um, yeah, now think of what's going on in Deuteronomy. Uh, this is God uh, teaching Israel through Moses. They're getting ready to go into the promised land that he had given them. And he's telling them about what it's going to be like in there, what challenges are they going to face, and so forth. All right. Uh, but they've just come out of Egyptian slavery, and then they've wandered in the wilderness for all these years, and now they're right on the verge of going into the promised land. And God says this in uh, chapter 12, verse 10. But when you go over the Jordan and live in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and when he gives you rest from all your enemies around so that you live in safety. And then it goes on uh, to say some other things are going to happen. But notice that, that phrase, when you go into the live in safety. So he, he's going to take them across the Jordan. Remember, they're going to have to fight for that land. So the, the, the moment they enter a Canaan, doesn't, which is their place of rest, all right, uh, it doesn't mean they're not going to have work to do. It doesn't mean they're not going to have challenges. In fact, warfare, uh, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't promise them that you're going to go into Canaan, the promised land, and just have a life of leisure and sit around and do nothing. He promises them rest uh, and peace, all right, because, you know, he says uh, you'll have rest from your enemies so that you can live in safety. He promises them security and so forth. It's going to take some time to achieve that, but that's what the promised land is supposed to be about eventually. Um, they're going to be able eventually to not be in a constant state of warfare and threat and exposure to threats. They aren't a great and powerful nation. Only with God are they so. And he, he promises uh that there will be a time when, when they can have that if they're faithful to him. He'll do that again and again with various kings, King David, King Solomon, and different times. He says he will give them rest from, from their enemies. Does that mean he that he'll give them a time when they don't have to work? 
they don't have to live by the sweat of their brow, no. Rest means something like an opportunity to live a full and normal life as life is intended. Uh, a time of security where, where they're able to pursue normal things. Okay, that's the idea of rest in the Old Testament and into the New, as we'll see. Hopefully you can see how that ties in with the idea of peace. Peace, as we said, does not necessarily mean an absence of conflict. It's really not about absence. It's about presence, the presence of God, the presence of Jesus. So you can have peace in the midst of, of a storm. So these two words really are, are, are important in adding sort of a, a depth to what we're talking about as it relates to peace. Let's tie these words in uh, to our faith in the New Testament, all right? So Jesus picks up this language, and the New Testament writers do, and there's just really two passages I want us to, to um, read and notice along that line. We'll do more of that in the New Testament next week. First one is in Matthew chapter 11, the words of Jesus. And he makes a promise here in, in Matthew 11 that um, uses this, this word, all right? Matthew 11, um, beginning at verse 28. Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Well, you know the answer. I will give you rest. Now, we're in the New Testament now, not the Hebrew language, but, but the Greek language. Uh, so we won't talk about exactly what that word is, but it's, we'll see how it just fits right hand in glove with what we already talked about. Jesus says, I will give, you, I will give rest to those who come to me who are full of labor and sort of a heavy burden. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Now, what does Jesus promise to those who come to him? He promises them rest. But what does that mean? Well, think of our discussion. What did it mean when God rested on the seventh day? What did it mean when he promised them rest from their enemies? That's the same kind of thing that Jesus is promising. Because he goes on. And notice what he says in verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest, rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He still talks in terms of a yoke and a burden, but now it's light. It's a light yoke. It's a light burden. Uh, he's going to bear that burden, you see. Uh, he can give rest. He can relieve enough of that where you can go about normal functioning of life. Uh, probably in, in context of what Jesus is talking about, originally he's dealing with people, remember, who were all bound up in Judaism and all the traditions, especially, and the heavy burdens um, that, of the traditions of, of the Jews at the time. And it was impossible to, to keep the law and, and avoid being criticized and pointed out as wrong by the Pharisees and so forth. Uh, if you go just a little bit further in that same, same chapter, well into the next chapter, uh, they're going to be all over Jesus and his disciples because on the Sabbath day they were walking through a, a grain field and, and just picked some heads of grain because they were hungry. Uh, and uh, the Pharisees define that as a violation, a work violation. And Jesus will eventually say, hey, guys, you're talking to the Lord of the Sabbath. Of course, they didn't believe that, but he knew what he was talking about. Uh, but, you know, Jesus makes the same kind of promise uh, to those who will come to him. He promises them rest. And we should think 
You know, rest and peace go hand in hand. One other place, and we'll finish with this tonight, where this really comes in is in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4. I'm just going to look at a couple of verses, but that whole chapter is applying the idea of rest to, um, to Christians. All right, so uh, you can study that whole chapter and, and get uh, this idea. But in Hebrews chapter 4, he's been talking about Sabbath. He uses the word Sabbath. The Hebrew writer does. Um, but he really begins applying it about verse 10. He says, uh, well, verse 9, So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Now remember uh, what the Hebrew writer does. He sort of compares the law of Moses and says what Jesus brings is better. He's sort of transitioning people from uh, the old law and especially its traditions to what is new in Christ. Okay. Um, and so, he's, but he says there's still the idea of rest in, in, in uh, Christ. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. In verse 10, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Referring back to creation, God rested on the seventh day. Then verse 11, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Don't have time to talk about everything that he's getting at there. It's a really important chapter. But just this idea of what remains for us. There remains for us a rest, a Sabbath rest. And again, I'm not talking about a day of the week that we observe uh, where we don't work versus we do. That's not what's getting uh, any kind of law like that. Um, we're not talking about a, a rest in the sense of of a stoppage of work. Um, you know, we get into Christ and suddenly we don't have to work anymore. Certainly, that's not true. Uh, what is the rest? It's it's sort of a security. It's something God provides us um, so we can function as we're supposed to function. Uh, there remains a Sabbath rest, and we, we, we need to enter into that rest. All these uh, texts from, from creation uh, through, through the Old Testament into the promises of Jesus, and then the application of it by the Hebrew writer, uh, we see how the idea of rest and peace go hand in hand. It's, uh, I think it's really important stuff. It takes a little... Thinking, um, got to put on your thinking cap to work through this. But I think it's really important. It's been helpful to me, especially thinking about uh, the creation account. I'll just, I'll tell you, I've always struggled with what to do with day seven. I, you know, we, the way we've taught it, or at least the way I've received the teaching, is that day was sort of an add-on day where God worked six days and then he didn't do anything on the seventh. But God obviously thought the seventh day was as important, if not more important than all the others, because he blessed that day and he wanted his people in the Old Testament to observe it. What was it that was so important? I think it's the idea of rest. And rest goes hand in hand with peace. But rest understood correctly, you see. Uh, just wanted you to think about that tonight. It's, it's a part of this discussion. And as I said, we'll get a little bit more next week into uh, the New Testament use of the word peace and some unique aspects of that. But uh, I thought this was something uh, that, that ought to be tied in to our study this evening. So again, hope you're uh, enjoying uh, the study and uh, that you're doing well. Uh, our prayers are with you. We look forward to to, to see in you on the Lord's Day if uh, you're local 
And if not, we, we hope you'll be able to assemble with God's people and, and praise Him on Sunday. But I uh, hope this is a help to you in the middle of this week. God bless you. And uh, think about the, the rest and the peace that He supplies us. Uh, we will see you again soon. Thanks for tuning in.